you're going to hit uh, as many times as possible. You have those conversations and, and you have to be accessible. You know, if, if somebody sends you a message on Facebook, you've got to return it. If somebody sends you an email, they want to have that kind of information because people really don't know who you are when, when you've not run the position. But this time was a lot easier because I had work to show that I had done in the legislature. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so next up, we have Amir from Northville High School. Hey there, representatives. Um, my name is Amir Tashula. As uh, Barack said, I'm from Northville High School. And my question for you guys is, what were you doing the night of your first victory? And how did you react to it? Oh, that's easy for me. I was worn out. <laughs> that was a couple years ago. Um, I couldn't wait till the polls uh, closed. Went home and, and sat down with my family. And, and because of the absentee ballots, we knew we'd have to wait a little while. So, of course, nobody got any sleep that night. But, you know, once the information came in, you know, that I had won the primary, I slept like a baby. Yeah, you know, I still remember mine so vividly. Uh, I walked back in after work and, you know, uh, you don't sleep that night. No. Um, the night before, and for us, it's the primary that we were focused on. The night before, uh, every single car in the street, we put flyers on every house. And so you're up all night, you're campaigning, starting at seven in the morning, polls close at eight o'clock. Um, when I walked back into our headquarters and people were gathered there at 8.30, uh, I walked in and, you know, people started the plotting because we, we just started a strong campaign. I just started crying. Um, and it's just because you put your heart and soul into this thing for almost a year, uh, ultimately to see what the results are in just, you know, in 12 hours. Um, and when we finally won, I was tackled to the ground by uh, a former colleague of ours, David Knizik. And, uh, you know, I hugged my mom, I hugged my father, and it was just a celebratory moment, uh, really, for the community. Um, and the, the picture that ran in the newspaper was my mother hugging me. Um, that was the picture that, that went around, and uh, that's, uh, you know, it, it met the world. Um, and I, I was told one thing, and I'll share with you. Uh, somebody told me, you know, remember who's in the room before they announce the results. That's who really supports you. And then remember who walks into the room after they announce the results. Um, then you, and you'll have the understanding of why they're there. Uh, and so I, I carry that with me. I still remember every single face that was there. Thank you for the responses. I'd like, now, I'd like to now hand it over to Tarek from International Academy. Hi, I'm Tarek. I'm a ninth grader at International Academy. So my question is, did friends and family treat you differently after you were elected? Were they more composed and professional when speaking with you? You know, it depends on the friends and family you ask. Um, I can tell you when I first met my father-in-law, I've been married for one year, uh, was in Turkey for my like anniversary trip. Um, my father-in-law said, you know, all politicians are liars. And I said, I'm not a liar. I said, you haven't been a politician long enough. Um, so you have a lot of friends and family that treat you the same. Uh, you have some that uh, like to, uh, uh, you know, push you even harder. And I'd like to say that's where my friends are. They keep it real. They, they haven't treated me differently. They're not trying to use you because, I mean, ultimately we're a state representative. It's not like uh, we can do, we can pull a lot of strings to get people any, you know, really great deals. Um, but people have been great. They've been honest. Uh, the one thing I say is you, you do open yourself up to a lot more criticism in the public eye. And so we do get, you know, the, the trolls on social media, um, oftentimes people will conflate criticism and disrespect. That's something that I also want to mention. Um, and it's not the same thing. You can criticize somebody honestly and truthfully, um, and you can cross the line and actually disrespect them and, and, and their families. Um, and hopefully nobody does that. Um, but it's, it's a learning process um, and your whole family is in the public eye. So you also have to keep that in mind as well. I think my, uh, the biggest change for me is when I joined the police department. I had some friends and family treat me different <laughs> then, <laughs> but but now no, not so much. And uh, being older, uh, people know what to expect from you. And I'll share something with I've I've run for office a couple of times and lost. And uh, a wise friend of mine told me this. He says, you know, when you win, you belong to everybody. When you lose, you're an orphan. So I've been an orphan a few times, but the people who loved me when I lost. I mean, we're so proud when I won. And, and you will know who's like, like Hamu said, when, when they come into the room, 
you know, they wait and see who's won. But the people who were there with you, it's it's the saying, I'm trying to think, if the people that catch the bus with you when you have nothing, those are your friends. But when you're riding in a limo, everybody wants to be your friend. So be very careful. And that's just true in, in high school. You know, if you're a star athlete, if you're the person that, that's getting all the attention, remember when nobody knew your name and knew who you weren't, but they knew who you were. So no, my, my friends and family haven't treated me. Some relatives have, they ask for stuff, but hey, nothing coming. Thank you very much, representatives. Next up is Elif from North Farmington High School. Hi, representatives, and thank you for um, taking the time to be with us today. And my question for you guys is, how does the Michigan House of Representatives operate? And how often do you speak on the floor? And when you do, what do you speak about? Now, when you say operate, I mean, it, it's it's set up. Um, hmm, that's a great question. I'm trying to figure out when you say operate. Well, we, we um, write bills. We go to committee. We sponsor them. They go through and then we vote on the floor. And it all depends on, you know, who allows your bills to go through. I mean, if you're a Republican right now, your bills will go through. If you're a Democrat, then you may have to work a little harder to, to get um, your your uh, bills turned into laws. But you can speak at any time. If there's an issue that is something that is that is uh, critical, that is personal, that is impactful for your district, then you, know, you just say, hey, I wanna speak on this bill. You can either speak for it or you can speak against it. So that's up to you, but everybody has the opportunity to have their voices heard. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Tyrone uh, answered the, the general question. Um, ultimately, you know, I, I guess they you know the anecdote I'll add is it doesn't matter how smart you are to try to operate the, the state legislature. What matters is the relationships that you build. Do you have a strong relationship with the speaker uh, who, who really runs the house? Do you have a strong relationship with the chairpersons of, of each committee? Do you have a strong relationship with the chair of the budget? Um, those relationships that you have, those personal and professional relationships, that's what allows you to really operate the legislature successfully uh, or not. Okay, and thank you again. And now to Khan from Ann Arbor here on high school. Hi, representatives. Uh, like I said, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to be out here today. So we noticed that um, while we were kind of researching for this webinar, we noticed that in the House of Representatives that you both serve in, Republicans have had the House majority and will keep it again after this November's election. So my question to you guys is, what is it like being in the minority party and how do you still push for your viewpoint? I like to think that me and Tyrone are in the double minority. <laughs> Absolutely. In some, in some capacity, uh, minority ethnicity or religion, minority uh, and race. Um, it, it sucks. I'll be the first to say it. It sucks to not have that gavel in your hand to be able to set the agenda to determine if your bill moves forward or not. And, uh, you know, um, you have to play ball by the majority's rule. You have to uh, make sure that you don't say anything that, that uh, angers anybody. I can tell you in my first term, it was a real learning lesson. Uh, I gave very passionate floor speeches on certain bills that came up that I thought were just downright racist and bigoted. Uh, when I did so, I was, quote unquote, blacklisted by the majority party uh, for a short period of time. None of my legislation and none of my work was allowed to move forward. They straight up told me to my face, your stuff will not move forward if you keep giving passionate speeches like this, even though that, that was my job to do so. And so um, you learn, you, you, you ask yourself, what does it mean to be a successful legislator? Legis legislator? Is it to give passionate floor speeches? Is it to get a bill across the finishing line? Is it to bring down more resources to your community? Um, so you have to ask yourself, you know, what kind of legislator you wanna be? How do you define success for your community? Uh, and then operate and tailor your operations uh, that way. That was a great answer. And what I'll add to it is, is the fact that you're in the minority. You don't have the votes to push your legislation through. So you, you have to create allies and, and you know friends on the other side. And you, you have to show the impact, not only for your district, but the entire state. Because again, if I make a, if I come up with a bill and a law, it may translate differently in Detroit than it does in say Bay City or Saginaw. 
So we have to be mindful. So I look for some colleagues on the Republican side and say, hey, this is my bill. And they do the same thing with us. They'll come and say, hey, Tyrone, I've got this bill. You know, what do you think? And knowing that I'm in the minority, I have to think, if this bill is bad, how can I make it less bad? If it's good, how can I make it better? So, you know, you, you have to be engaged. You, you have to talk to your colleagues. And again, you have to know that they have the numbers to move the crowd. So what you wanna do is learn the word compromise and, and how to work on something again, if it's bad, because there's been some bad bills this last couple of years. And if we hadn't spoken up as, as a caucus, then they would probably be worse. So that is the hard part of being in the minority, knowing that if you have great legislation, the probability of it getting through is, is real slim. Okay, thank you both. And uh, I'm just gonna hand it off to Aaron from Plymouth Canton High School. Um, sorry. Hi, representatives. So my question for you guys is, um, how do you deal with the representatives who oppose your viewpoints and the legislation that you fight for? Oh, that, that, that's easy. You, you can't take it personal. Um, if you start taking this stuff personal, oh my goodness, then, then you'll have a horrible existence. You'll be, you'll be angry all the time. And, and you have to learn that it's not personal. It is really business. And people have to vote their constituents, meaning district six, there may be a bill that my constituents in district six says, heck no. But I may have to look at it and say, well, you know, it's really not that bad. How can I get them to a yes? But it's really a, a tough, um, it's a tough act because so many bills that we've had and, and were good legislation, we've been told no. So you understand that you, you can't take it personal and you just try to find a way to, to get it to yes. So you can draft a bill and then you can have those conversations and you can amend it to change it. So you, you have to learn the, uh, the art of compromise and, and the art of trying to, uh, to make a deal. Uh, I mean, to that point, ultimately you need 56 votes in the house floor to get it across the finish line. And then you need 20 in the Senate and then you need the governor's signature. And so you have a lot of compromise to do with many parties. Um, and you definitely can't take it personal. I can tell you that, you know, even when you see sometimes politicians bickering, saying this, you know, uh, state rep X dropped a press statement, uh, you know, kind of bashing state rep Y for, for introducing this legislation. Oftentimes those two are, still, are probably still friends on the House floor and they gave each other a heads up that there's a press release coming out uh, targeting that bill that they just absolutely oppose because of their community. Um, I can tell you, I've done that before, where I've approached a colleague of mine who I disagreed vehemently on a piece of legislation they were introducing, and I gave him a heads up. I said, heads up, hey, listen, I'm going to go to the press, and I'm, I have to bash your bill because it's an awful piece of legislation, uh, but let's grab lunch um, and, and, and see what else we can work on. Uh, I had a legislator of mine who, uh, me, him and I disagreed on gun policies across the board, and I'd never, I'd never shot a gun before. He took me to a shooting range. He taught me to shoot a gun. Uh, while uh, we debated other issues and policies. When we went back to the legislature, we disagreed on that fundamentally, but we found something else to work on and we actually passed it. And that was the first bill I got signed into law. And so you also have to keep your mind open because you might disagree on one topic with this legislator, but there's five or six others that you do agree on uh, where you can work together. Thank you, representatives. Um, so our next question comes from Defne from Seaholm High School. Hi, representatives. Uh, my question for you guys is, what would you say are some of your proudest moments or accomplishments of your career so far? Ooh, um, you know, uh, the biggest accomplishment, I'd say one of the more meaningful ones, uh, you know, in the south end of Dearborn, which borders the southwest Detroit, uh, Rep. Carter's district, uh, it's one of the most polluted areas in the whole of the state where asthma rates are three to four times uh, the, the state average. Um, there was, back in 2016, there was a power plant that tried to add a new turbine. And essentially what would happen is, you know, they filed for a permit from the state. If the permit were to be approved, they would have added over 1,000 new tons of pollution. So what we did was we mobilized the community. We attended community town halls. We crashed um, the department hearings to voice our concern and our opposition to this permit. We made so much noise that the media picked it up, 
Canadian elected officials started chiming in in support of our movement saying if this factory gets this permit, um, this one factory will, will pollute more than all of Windsor combined. Uh, ultimately to the point where the CEO of this company called me and said they're withdrawing the permit. They agree with us. This was a mistake on their end and an oversight. It should not have happened. Um, and the community got a win. Uh, it didn't happen through passing any legislation. And this permit was slated to get approved. But because we ran an effective PR campaign, really, and we mobilized hundreds and, and had, had over a thousand signatures on a petition, um, and we, we stayed strong and consistent, uh, we kind of got that victory. And now we've repeated it several times. But once you show the community that it's possible, um, then they start setting their sights on, well, what more can we do if we keep this up? I would just piggyback on that. And, and that has been one of the reasons that I actually ran for office. I actually live in 48217, which, you know, by definition and, and uh, statistics is the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan. So we've had environmental issues way before the Flint water crisis. So we've been working on those things. And, and when we get a win, it's a big win. But I, I would like to say that one of my, my uh, best moments, well, I've got two really, was having a bill become a law that was a compassionate care bill for prisoners that were um, in ill health. And, and what's interesting about that now, it predated COVID. So now it's the precursor to COVID because of um, you know, a person's physical health whether you may be stage four cancer, you may have renal. So it, it's more effective to allow that person to get parole to go home. But the favorite part of this job is, and, and I had one Saturday, today's Sunday, you know, I forget what the holidays. One of my constituents turned 90 years old and they had an outdoor drive by and I went over there with this nice tribute to the family and the police shut down the street. And that just really made her day. That is the wonderful part of this job that you, you get to touch lives in a way that we have no idea where they're gonna go. That and having this conversation with you all tonight, you know, those are the best parts of this job. I mean, the hard parts is going up there and, and fighting with another 109 legislators, but the impact that we have in the community, I think is uh, the best moments. Thank you both for your answers. And the next question is from Colin Altak from Northville High School. My question is, how does the Michigan House help protect the citizens of Michigan during this ongoing coronavirus pandemic? Well, that's a great question. I, I think that, well, I'll just speak for myself. I'm on the COVID um, select joint uh, committee, and we're having conversations about those things. But I agree with everything that the governor has done to protect the citizens. I mean, the legislator, the legislators, filed a lawsuit, the Republicans, because they felt that she was acting um, on her own, which in fact, when you look at what she's done and, and the, the policies, the general orders, everything that she's put in place has been done to protect life. And even with this latest one, a lot of people didn't understand why you put three weeks. Well, maybe it won't be three weeks, but I'll tell you, we had three of the probably more opportunities that people would get together. Number one, I know you guys are young, you don't know this. The largest bar night in the country is the night before Thanksgiving because people are home from college, people travel. If you watch the news, they come in. And while parents and everybody are cooking, they go and hang out. So we had to shut that down. Thanksgiving, personally, we have about 50 people at my house for Thanksgiving. It's seven in my family. It's uh, eight in my wife's family and we all get together and we have a big meal. So that didn't happen this year. So there's no super. And the last but not least, which probably interests you guys more than anything with the uh, PlayStation 5 out was uh, Black Friday. People will stand in lines. They will forget about social distancing to save a couple of bucks. So for the governor to issue that order, we stand behind her 100. Well, I stand behind her 100%. Um. You know, in addition to uh, what Rep. Carter spoke to, there's much that we do. Um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, uh, before the first case actually came up in Michigan, I, I, I worked on a package of bills uh, with a group of legislators to waive all out-of-pocket costs for testing and treatment. 
And uh, I still remember that before the first case uh, w w was found, we wanted to introduce legislation. We got pushback. People telling us, don't introduce it just yet. This sounds like a radical idea that insurance companies are not going to pay, are going to have to pay for all of this. Uh, we introduced it anyways. And insurance companies opposed it initially. Uh, but working with the governor and some community organizations, it actually was adopted as state policy without uh, actually having the bill signed into law, which was great. Um, so that was one way we worked through the legislature. Uh, secondly, um, I knew off the bat, so my background is epidemiology. So I operated in the world of public health uh, before going into the legislature. Uh, I knew information was, was key and vital. And so uh, I used actually my campaign funds to draft uh, a one-page letter that told you how can you contract COVID and then one, you know, and how you can avoid to con contract COVID. And, uh, and the other side was what to do if you do have COVID. And we also sent a magnet um, and we did this for about 20,000 out of the 30,000 homes in Dearborn, what we could afford at the time. And the magnet had every helpful number, like the mental health hotline, the COVID health hotline, the local hospital hotline, the unemployment agency hotline, the emergency hotline, um, so that every household that at least had the key numbers on the refrigerator should something happen and needed assistance. And so we did our best to try to tackle through both ways. We had, you know, we had phone calls going out, the magnet and the mailer, and also work in the legislation collectively to see what we can do together. Thank you. Next is Ozan from NRBF Huron High School. Hi, I'm Ozan Euler and I go to Huron High School. And my question to you both is, how do you guys deal with the press and the public? <laughs> you take it one article at a time. Uh, before assuming office, uh, we got advice from uh, the editor of the Cranes Detroit uh, newspaper. Uh, it's a prominent newspaper in the, in, the, in the state. And his advice was take every single interview, take every single meeting you can with the media, conservative, liberal, progressive, whatever it might be, and fail. And through those failures, learn from it. Um, you're never going to have a perfect interview uh, your first time around or even your 10th time around. You're always going to slip up. After every interview, you go back, you watch it a dozen times, you tell yourself, man, I could have said this better. I could have done this better. I should have brought this up. Sometimes you go in with the plan, but you walk away saying, why the heck did I not stick to the plan? Um, and so when it comes down to the media, you want to control the narrative. You have to understand that you can pivot if you need to pivot. The media sometimes wants to ask you a question and, and, and put you in a position that you, uh, to answer a question that you might not necessarily have to answer it might not even be uh, about the topic that you're there to talk about, um, but you have to know how to pivot and that comes with practice. And the only way you practice is if you take on those interviews, you fail at them uh, to the point that you learn and you have to be open to, uh, to feedback, constructive feedback from your team, uh, from those who care about you. We have a media team uh, that we work with as well in the caucus, um, but from our colleagues ourselves, a lot of our colleagues will walk up to us and say, hey, you, you did this great. If I were you, I would have you know, maybe said one, two, and three differently. Um, so you just have to be open and, and accept that you're not going to be perfect. Well, I think the, the first issue is you, you probably want to know what the interview is going to be about. And let's just say, uh, gotcha. So do your homework. Uh, know what the issue is. Um, try to give as much information. And, and be honest, if you don't know, you don't know. If, if there's something that happened, you can always say, hey, let me find out for you. But the worst thing you want to do is to lie <laughs> or, or I mean, no comment is not a lie. If you don't wanna talk about it, say no comment, but know your homework, um, go in and, and know that you could always do better. There has never been a perfect interview and practice will get you better at it and do not avoid it because silence, not saying anything, uh, lets people run wild with conspiracies. So take the interview, have the conversation. You may learn something at the time, and it's always easy to say, let me find out and I'll get back to you on that. Thank you both. Now, next up is Yeliz and she goes to Northville High School. Thank you. Um, my, my question for you guys is, what are your future goals as a representative and what would you like to accomplish? I've got one more turn after this and uh, being a little older, I'm actually 58. I retired, started a business, then I got elected. So there's probably only one other job that I would actively pursue outside of this one. And we'll wait and see what happens. But other than that, I'm uh, 
I'm good with being a representative. I'm good with trying to make the state of Michigan, District 6, and uh, everybody's lives better. But uh, I got into the game late. So I'm, I'm curious to hear what uh, my colleague's going to say, because he's got a long way to go. Um, it's a great question. You know, uh, I'll tell you this. When I, I never imagined myself in public office. Um, not many people do. You don't plan on it. Right. Uh, and I did, uh, I entered it at a young age, younger than, you know, the, the most, I was 26. Um, sometimes it feels like I've been doing this forever already because it does beat you down uh, in some ways. Um, all I know is I love public service uh, and I missed it. I, I love working with the community, love giving back. Um, I'm not sure what the next step will entail, but I do know whatever career path I go down, it will be with public service uh, to some degree and some capacity, whether it be elected office or whether it be nonprofits, um, I love my community, born and raised in the city. Uh, and like Tyrone said, you know, Dearborn born, Dearborn raised, and pretty soon I'll be Dearborn dead. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for the responses. And next we have Ezzy from Huron High School. Hi. So the last question we have for you is, what is your advice to high schoolers or minorities who are interested in becoming a politician one day? You know, my advice is uh, to young people, you know, find what you're passionate about. Uh, find that person who isn't, who is an elected office, who you might be, uh, who you might, you know, think highly of and see if you can get an internship in their office, reach out, shoot an email. Uh, you'd be surprised at how far those emails go. We've had high school interns, we've had uh, college, uh, you know, undergrad, graduate school, you name it. Um, if you don't have a person in mind, find an organization that's uh, politically uh, engaged to some degree. Get involved in that organization surrounding that issue that you're very passionate about. Um, that's the first place to start. Uh, get exposure. If you've never worked a campaign, if you've never volunteered, if you've never handed out a flyer, if you've never knocked on doors, uh, go get a taste uh, uh, for what that feels like um, because it's an extremely important part of the job. Our most important part of the job is not the stuff that we do in Lansing. It's the stuff we do back home. It's the conversations that we have. It's the town halls. It's the coffee hours. It's the one-on-one -on -one conversations on people's doorsteps where they tell us what their concerns are and we try to formulate a response and ideas of what we need to put forth when, when we're in Lansing. Um, that's the stuff that gets you reelected. Nobody remembers what, what bill number, you know, House Bill 4518. Nobody knows what bill number you introduced or what bill you got passed. They remember when I reached out to you for my unemployment issue, did you get it fixed? Right. Uh, when DTE did, you know, when there was this uh, massive road construction that was, uh, you know, taken away from my quality of life, did you listen to me? And did you try to do something about it? Um, when a factory was trying to increase more pollution in the air, did you push back standing with us? That's the stuff that people will remember. Uh, so get a feel for that. Be involved in your community uh, at a very grassroots level um, before thinking about running for office. It's not easy to put yourself out there, but if you're up to the task, and I imagine many of you are, you're spending Sunday evening with, uh, with me and Tyrone. I don't know why you do that uh, if you weren't passionate about it. Um, but if you were passionate about it, shoot us an email. Uh, we'll connect you with your state rep so you can have those conversations. So maybe you can shadow us for a day in Lansing, once it's allowed again, I'm assuming, you know, after the, the COVID vaccines and such, um, we'd be more than happy to set. I think, uh, I think he covered it very well. The, the thing I would say is find out if that's what you really want to do. And if you really want to do it, find someone who's doing it, you know, do an internship, uh, work at a local office, volunteer. Um, people want to, they, they see, the end product of the job. They see after you get elected, they see, you know, they see you on TV, but they don't know everything that goes into it. So you want to get a ground level view, volunteer. Um, there's some actual paid internship opportunities as well. So if that's something that you're interested in, that you're passionate about, and it doesn't even have to be politics. It could be business. It could be medicine. It could be sports, whatever it is, find someone who's doing it. And I promise you, Anybody who's successful that's doing it, they're willing to share their ups and downs. But the biggest thing is you got to want to do it and you got to love people to do this job because that, that is the biggest thing that, that I, I do. You got to care about the people. 
and people will know if you're genuine or you're just phony. So, but to your young people who are interested, reach out. Like Abdullah said, we, we can find out who your rep is and just the shadow. You may hang out with a, uh, an elected official and figure out, nah, this is not for me, or I don't wanna be an elected official. I wanna be a person who works on that campaign or works on in that office to take care of the constituents. So there's a lot more to it, but you'd have to see it. And uh, you, there's opportunities to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna hand the floor to Mehmet again. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the town hall portion of our webinar. Um, I hope this is a good experience for everybody. It sure was for me. And the representatives they spoke passionately and they really shared their experiences. And I know one day I'm kind of interested in politics myself and being uh, not only like, you know, a minority, but also my religion is different than some of the others. Um, this was a good experience. So now we're going to go on to our chat questions. And we have, I think, four so far. And we want to try to um, maybe move like a bit uh, quickly, maybe only one politician or one public servant can handle, you know, each one um, so we can get through them all and like alternate. So then we'll start. Um, if you want to unmute and read your question when it comes to your turn, you can do that as well and introduce yourself. So the first one is from uh, Nilifer, if you want to read your question. Uh, sure. Yeah, I uh, thank you for uh, attending uh, to this uh, webinar, both representatives. I really enjoyed so far. So my question is, uh, how do you get prepared for this job? Like, uh, let's say after high school, what did you do? Or uh, I think that's the beauty of this job is everybody's got a different background. You could be a farmer, you can be, uh, you know, a, a, a county sheriff. Um, kind of like how Tyrone was in law enforcement. I was a public health professional. Uh, we have some teachers, we had some lawyers, we had some veterinarians. Um, there's, no, there's no path. The only qualification to become a state representative is you have to win the election. There's no required degree. There's just a minimum age. Uh, and so unfortunately, it's not always the brightest bulbs that win the election. It's those who uh, happen to run the best election to some degree. <laughs> But so, to win it, uh, you need to be uh, 21. Well, At 21, you can sign up to run for office. And uh, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to have a degree. No college degree or high school diploma required, technically. But to be a candidate, you, uh, I mean, you wanted to be candidate, right? It helps. It certainly helps to have a degree to speak on some previous experience, so on and so forth. But there are no requirements. The only requirement requirement is an age requirement, um, uh, and that's all. Okay, and uh, the, another one was maybe related, like I was uh, wondering uh, what the fundamental steps you need to take to be a politician. Like you need, do you need to learn uh, law, like state law or um, how the legislation works or some kind of background in uh, education? All of that is good, but the biggest thing you wanna know, what are the issues that concern the people that you wanna represent? So if, if you're gonna run, say if you're gonna run in district six, you need to know the five, six core issues because you're not gonna know all of them. But the most important ones for the people who represent that, that are really personal to them. Like uh, Abdullah said, you know, air quality is huge in my district. The cost of car insurance is huge in my district the disparity when it comes to education. So you have to tap those three things because you can go in and say, well, I'm talking about this and you'll shut people off. Know the issues that are critical and important to the people that you plan on representing. Thank you. The next question I actually asked and it's um, Representative Hamoud, as well as Representative Carter, you said that you had public health experience and then also um, experience in the, with the police. How does your knowledge in those respective fields help your career in the Michigan House? Well, I'll go first and, and real quick. Well, right now, after George Floyd, what we're talking about is, is criminal justice reform. What we're talking about is police oversight. What we're talking about is accountability. So I've got a double-edged sword. I'm a black man who happens to be a retired police lieutenant. So I've seen it from both sides. So what people want 
is consequences for actions. And those are actually a couple of bills that I'm working on. So my prior experience in law enforcement gives me that, that information, that, that experience that I can go in and I'm considered an expert in law enforcement in the state of Michigan. So I can go in and have those conversations and it won't be based on what I heard, what I read. It'll be based on actual knowledge of what I know and what I've uh, experienced. Yeah, I mean, to that point, uh, you know, pre-COVID, I don't think anybody knew what an epidemiologist was. Uh, there's only one in the legislature. I'm right here. <laughs> and so uh, when I first got that degree, um, you know, I lied and told my grandmother it was a, a program to get me into medical school. Uh, cause I, didn't know I, did, I didn't know how to tell her that I never got accepted into medical school. Um, but now, I, I, now it's extremely important. Now I, I know the research behind medicine. I know the vaccination process. I know uh, you know, I trained in basically the preparation for tackling pandemics uh, and the, the, the uh, prevention of, of, of health epidemics. Uh, and so uh, that knowledge is extremely res uh, resourceful. You know, we introduced legislation before COVID hit Michigan because of this background that I had. I know who to reach out to. Next week, we're hosting a town hall with uh, an expert uh, healthcare professional out of the National Institute of Health. Um, just contacts and relationships that I have in my prior life they were able to bring to the fold and utilize as legislators. Hi, I'm Tarek and I have a question. So when making bills and representing your community, do you focus on what will be best for them or what they actually want, even if this may not be the best option and could hurt them? That, that's a great question. And that's a balance you have to look at, not just for your constituents, your district, how will this impact the state of Michigan as a whole? Because there's, I mean, we have metropolitan areas, we have rural areas. So the law is gonna be applied differently in certain areas. Uh, and I'll just use law enforcement. If we come up with a rule, a law, an idea, it's going to be enforced a lot differently in Detroit than it is in say Ann Arbor, um, Muskegon, Flint, so you, you have to look at the total and sometimes because it's a good law for your district doesn't mean it's a, it's a great law for the state of Michigan. So you have to look for that balance. Yeah, we often keep repeating in the caucus, vote your district. Whenever a bill comes up, that's mixed. Um, you know, if you're in the UP, uh, you might not, you, you, you might, you're going to vote, you're going to vote differently than if you're from Southeast Michigan on certain issues. Um, I think the auto insurance law, if you guys dig into that, that was one of the most controversial bills because it had both good and bad in it. And it was going to impact your community, your community, both good and bad. Yeah. Um, and so you really had to uh, dig in and either vote you make, you're going to get criticism for. It. And so you have to be able to, you have to be well-educated and well-versed in the reasoning. Why is this bill good? Why is this bill bad? But ultimately, why did I vote the way I did? Uh, and on what assumptions for my community? Um, and so it's, it's not easy. It's a balancing act. You'll learn it. Um, the majority of bills you vote on are pretty clear cut, pretty easy, but the really monumental bills that will make a difference are never that clear cut. Okay, so I think I'm the last question in the chat, unless somebody wants to say something else. Um, or yeah, <laughs> see another one came up. Okay, so my question is, there's been a lot of feuding between Democrats and Republicans, especially in the media, and especially like during this election. And my question for you is, how is your relationship between representatives in the opposite party? And how has it affected your relationships with them? Well, I'll just go quickly. I've got great relationships. I mean, you know, on the national level, there's always going to be differences based on you know party principles but for the most part at the end of the day most people are our people and and we all want the same things we just got to figure out a way uh how to get there yeah i mean i'll in my in my first term right now we have a speaker of the house name is lee chatfield uh in my first term four years ago uh lee and i and several other democrats and republicans used to play basketball together every thursday at six o'clock in the morning and that's how we built strong relationships. You, you have to leave the Capitol building. You have to stop talking about politics for a second uh, and be on the same team in a different capacity. Um, and that relationship on the court allowed us to have a very great relationship this term uh, in the legislature. And so what you see oftentimes in the media is, is just built up and, and it happens. It's, it's more of a national scale trickling down than it is at the state level going up. Um, and, and, and what you also see is sometimes people are just doing political posturing. 
Uh, you saw a lot of Republican U.S. senators refusing to accept the, you know, the, the Biden presidential results. But then you'll see videos surface of uh, them walking up to Kamala Harris to congratulate her and fist bump her uh, when they think nobody's watching. Uh, and so, you know, don't always believe what's in the media. I don't, I don't want to sound like Trump with that, with that line. <laughs> um, uh, but sometimes people do things to just fuel their base, uh, when in reality, they're actually really good friends. I think there's one final question. I think we have a little bit of time left. So we can take this last question. Um, it's what would you recommend Turkish American youth to be more visible as part of the cultural mosaic of Michigan and have their voices heard? It, it's a great question. You know, I just, came, I literally tell you, I just came off the flight um, in 20 hours in the air, uh, went to Istanbul to uh, Ephesus and uh, uh, um, uh, Turkey is a beautiful place. Um, what I say is this, uh, what we started organizing was like a minority day and at Lansing, we have an Arab American day at Lansing, there is a Maltese American day at Lansing, there's a uh, Latino American, Hispanic American day in Lansing. Um, it wouldn't be too difficult to organize a Turkish American day in Lansing, where you gather Turkish Americans from across the state to come to Lansing, and to show that uh, you're a sizable portion of the Michigan population you meet with your legislators, you talk about issues that you care about, and we get a resolution passed to just recognize Turkish Americans for the accomplishments that they make, not only to the state of Michigan, but across the country. Um, that's something that more minority groups have been able to do. Um, and then, you know, if you wanna set aside uh, the, the Turkish uh, label, if there's a, a religious, you know, I know a majority of Turk, uh, Turks might be Muslim. Um, there are, there's also a Muslim American capital day that you can participate, or there's a Christian uh, uh, capital day. Um, so there's other ways for you to participate as Turkish Americans as well. But if you want to specifically on a Turkish American label, organize, um, contact one of your state legislators and say, hey, can you help us organize this event? And I promise you, uh, many of us would be happy to co-sponsor uh, and, to, and to help host that event up in Lansing. Um, once we're able to do so, obviously, uh, after COVID. Well, the, the biggest thing is, and he touched on it, is find out what other groups are doing and, and just emulate that and do your homework. You may have a Turkish American state rep. It could be Republican or Democrat. Find out who they are, find out what common things you have in common and look at somebody who's already doing what you're, you're trying to do and find out how they did it. Thank you, representatives. And I think we can all, all 26 people in the 800 plus whoever is watching from the Facebook Live as Turkish Americans, we can take that as a note, you know, for our community, we have to lead our community. But thank you representatives for coming to speak tonight with us and really educating our community. I think this was definitely a big learning experience for us. So right now let's all unmute and give a round of applause to representative Hamoud and representative Carter for coming and speaking to us. So thank you representatives for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. you guys should uh, host uh, the presidential debates. You guys do a pretty good job. <laughs> Thank you. It was a hard work of our entire team. We all worked very hard. No, thank and you so much for having us. Yes. Thank you. And we'll, does anybody have any, does Representative Hamoud or Representative Carter, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to say? Keep at it. You guys are doing a great job just based on this. Um, keep at it. And however I can help, and I know I speak for Tyrone as well, however we can help, uh, lean on us, count on us, shoot us an email, uh, shoot us an Instagram DM, whatever it might be, Facebook message. Um, we'll answer, we'll reply, and we got your backs. Well, my social media game isn't as <laughs> tight as his, but uh, just continue what you're doing. I mean, to, to get 26 uh, of your peers on a Sunday night to get together and have this conversation, like you say, have 800 people watching, you can see that the appetite is there. So uh, get them while you got them and, and move forward. Okay, then with that ending note, thank you representatives for coming and we're going to conclude the webinar at this time. Have a great night. All right. You too. Thank you. Thank you very much. You Have too. a good night. Thank you so much. Good job, guys. Yeah, good job. Thank you. Whew.